Good morning. Thank you for joining us today for the November 2021 CF webinar. I'm Susan Four, and along with William Greenhalgh and Candace Christofferson, we'll be your host this morning. The event is being recorded. For closed captioning, please click on the link in the chat feature. So today you'll be hearing about some of the latest updates on services, programs, and policies related to your work with CalPERS. The presentation will take about two and a half hours, which includes a 10 minute break. There'll be time for questions following each presentation and at the general roundtable at the end of the webinar. Next slide, please. Okay, a few housekeeping items. As I mentioned, this is being recorded and it will be available on the CalPERS website next week. All attendees' mics are muted. And today's meeting materials are available on the CalPERS CF webpage. But if you have any problems locating the materials, feel free to email the SEAC mailbox and we'll be sure to get those to you. That email is calpers underscore SEAC at calpers.ca.gov. And next slide, please. In addition to submitting your questions in the Q&A box, you can use the raised hand feature. You can do this by clicking the raised hand icon at the bottom of your screen. Your host will then unmute your mic so that you can ask your question. To lower your hand, select lower hand. And please don't forget to mute your mic after you're finished asking your question. Next slide, please. Okay, so we've gathered several CalPERS leaders and team members for this event. Andrea Peters will give us a legislative update. Brad Hansen and Tim Herbach will update us on compensation and payroll reporting issues. Michelle Morris from Membership Reporting is here with an update on membership and arrears. Then we'll take a 10 minute break. When we return from break, Ryan Beaker will update us on my CalPERS system enhancements. Bobby Satern will then provide an update on health plan direct pay. And then Christina Rollins will give us a quick recap of the 2021 education forum that took place last month. And finally, Brad and Christina will lead us in a question and answer session. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to our first presenter, Andrea Peters. Next slide, please. Good morning. My name is Andrea Peters and I will be providing you a quick legislative update. Today, we will be discussing four bills. Senate Bill 278, Senate Bill 294, Senate Bill 411, and Senate Bill 634. Prior to today's meeting, attendees were provided a PDF document titled CalPERS Bill List. This document contains summaries of the bills CalPERS is actively monitoring, including the ones I plan to discuss today. Also, in the chat box, there is a link that will take attendees to a similar bill list that is available online that updates real time. When you click on the link, it will take you to the CalPERS legislation website. Under the heading, Current Legislation, there are two options, one titled State and the other titled Federal. Attendees will want to select the State option. The State link will direct attendees to a third party website called Capital Track. This website provides a list of bills that CalPERS is actively monitoring in a slightly different format than the PDF provided today. When the attendee clicks on a bill number, for example, AB 97, the attendee will be provided more information about the bill, such as a high level summary of the bill, where the bill is in the legislative process and what actions have been taken on the bill. This information is updated real time and is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, pending website maintenance or IT issues. I would recommend saving the link for future reference and we will be sure to send out the link in an email following today's meeting. Again, you can find this information about the link and the bills that we are covering today in the chat box. Those bills, once again, are Senate Bill 278, Senate Bill 
294, Senate Bill 411, and Senate Bill 634. Senate Bill 278, among other things, defines disallowed compensation and stipulates what would occur if disallowed compensation is reported by the state, school employer, or contracting agency, including requiring the employer, as applicable, to pay to the impacted retired member, survivor, or beneficiary a portion of the actuarial equivalent of any reduced retirement benefit and to pay to CalPERS any overpayment paid out to the retired member, survivor, or beneficiary that resulted from the reporting of disallowed compensation. It also allows the state, school employers, and contracting agencies to submit additional proposed compensation items to be included in a memorandum of understanding or a collective bargaining agreement to CalPERS to determine compliance with existing law. This bill was signed by the governor on September 27th and will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. CalPERS team members are working on a circular letter that will provide additional information on how CalPERS has and will be implementing this bill. Next is Senate Bill 294, which removes a provision from existing law that limits the amount of service credit a school member may accrue while on an approved leave of absence to serve as an elected officer of an employee organization. The current service credit limit is 12 years. This bill was signed by the governor on October 5th and will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. To the best of our knowledge, no school member has been impacted by this cap. And with the removal of this cap, CalPERS expects there to be no impact to school members within the CalPERS system. Our third bill is Senate Bill 411. This bill removes the mandate to reinstate a retired member for violations of the working after retirement laws while allowing reinstatement if circumstances warrant it. This amendment to existing law would provide CalPERS, employers, and retired members the opportunity to resolve working after retirement violations more efficiently. Reinstatement can involve significant costs to the retired member, including the loss of accrued cost of living adjustments. Rather than reinstatement, retirees could pay penalties consistent with the amount of time working in violation. This bill will not change the rules and requirements for those who work after retirement, nor does it reduce CalPERS authority to impose reinstatement. It simply provides an additional option to resolve working after retirement violations. The CalPERS board had taken a support position on this bill. Senate Bill 411 was signed by the governor on July 23rd and will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. Our final bill is Senate Bill 634, the Retirement Omnibus Bill, which has several provisions that impact CalPERS. The first provision specifies that the membership enrollment date for optional members is the start date for the appointment if the membership election is received by CalPERS within 90 days of the start date. If the election is received after 90 days, the enrollment date would be the first day of the month in which the election is received by CalPERS. Optional members are generally local elected officials, governor's appointees, and legislative appointees. Existing law does not provide deadlines for this election, which has allowed for confusion with both employers and optional members. This provision provides a clear timeline to make and process these elections, while providing both employers and the optional members the flexibility of a 90-day window. The second provision allows CalPERS to collect any overpayment made to or on the behalf of any member, former member, or beneficiary from any future benefit payment that may be payable. When a retiree passes, 
There is often an overpayment that has been paid, which must be collected and reconciled with the benefits associated with the individual. When there is an ongoing benefit payment, CalPERS is usually able to reconcile the overpayment by withholding the amount from the ongoing payment. However, for lump sum payments, this reconciliation may not always be possible. This provision gives CalPERS team members the authority to recover overpayments by withholding the owed amount from future payments, which will reduce the number of uncollected overpayments. This authority is modeled after a CalSTRS law enacted in 1976. The third provision conforms the paperwork process for CalPERS members electing to continue as CalPERS members in CalSTRS positions to the CalSTRS paperwork process signed into law last year. This amendment will not change any of the eligibility requirements related to members making this election. It simply makes conforming changes to which entities receive the election form paperwork. The final provision makes a clarifying amendment to the notification provisions of a state funded health benefit program for the surviving spouses of specified safety officers. The amendment would clarify that CalPERS can receive notification of a safety officer's death from any reliable and verifiable source eliminating any ambiguity that exists in current law. Senate Bill 634 was signed by the governor on September 16th and will go into effect on January 1st, 2022. This concludes my presentation. Do we have any questions? Not hearing any, if we do have any additional questions, feel free to post them in the Q&A box and we will respond through the Q&A box. Looks like we do have one question. Awesome, thank you, Bill. Okay, uh, Maria, you may go ahead and unmute your microphone. Maria? Okay. Um, looks like we may have issue, uh, technical issues on her, the other end. So um, go ahead and put your questions in the chat and we will respond there. Sounds wonderful. Thank you, Bill. Right. Again, thank you everyone for your time. And I will now turn the presentation over to Brad Hansen in the Employer Account Management Division and Tim Skareback in the Retirement Benefit Services Division. Thank you, Andrea. Um, so those who, for those who don't know me, uh, my name is Brad Hansen. I'm the Assistant Division Chief in our Employer Account Management Division, and I oversee our compensation area. And with me today, a person that probably needs no introduction, um, a dear valued colleague of mine, Tim Herbeck, is going to also be speaking about some uh, retirement issues that we've been in encountering with the calculation side of the house. Um, so without any further ado, um, let's go ahead and get started. Um, next slide, please. So um, the first topic I want to discuss today has to deal with uh, school pay rate issues. Um, there was re a recent audit finding or two on this particular issue, and I'm going to do my best today to try to illustrate the way that a pay rate should be calculated, placed on your pay schedule, and reported to CalPERS. It is kind of complex, and I'm going to give an example of a monthly. There are examples also of hourlies or dailies. And if you're interested in that, um, feel free to email me directly or send an email to our MOU underscore review at calpers.ca.gov mailbox. And we can provide those type of examples too. But for the sake of time today, I'm just going to cover the monthly example. Next slide, please. Okay, so the pay rate issue. Um, so first, let's dive into the government code a little bit. So under 201, to, or excuse me, 20636.1, that's for uh, the school compensation law, it defines that a school employee's full-time work week is actually 40. Now, I know a lot of districts actually have um, different schedules. Quite often, we'll see like 37 and a half, 38 hours, anywhere from 35 to 40 I've seen with schools. The issue is, is the pay rate that's being reported to us is based on 37, 30, 
7.5 or 38 hours. The pay rate should truly be converted as if the person worked 40. Next slide, please. Additionally, there's a companion lot of this, 20962. And 20962 defines what full-time service credit is. So for a full-time service credit for a member, it has to be 10 months of full service. So if you, know, if you work 10 full-time months, you get your full month of service credit. 215 days of service is a full year of service. And then 1,720 hours of service equals one year of service. So in essence, to earn a full month of service, a person has to work 172 hours in a month to get that full service credit. Our kind of quick down and dirty calculation for service credit is take the earnings, divide it by the full-time pay rate, and that should give you your service credit. And that's where the crux of the issue is. If you don't convert your pay rate at a 40 and you match the earnings to the pay rate, a member will get a full month of service credit when in essence, they really should be earning a percentage of a month. And I'm gonna illustrate that in our examples coming up here. Next slide, please. Okay, so here's my example. Um, I think it's best to show you an example. Whenever you're dealing with numbers, um, it's just kind of best to see it, you know, a visual of it. And again, if you want more examples of this, or if you want my team to check into how you're doing your conversions, please um, contact us and we'll let you guys know um, if it's being done correctly. Okay, so this is an example. We have a member here. Um, she is a full-time employee. Um, she works 260 days, which is 7.5 hours per day. Her annual earnings are $94,271.46. So before we get into the calc, let's first break these down into our daily and our hourly pay rate. So, you know, the way you would figure the daily out is you take that $94,000 earnings, divide it by the days the person worked, and that's their daily rate. So in this case, it'd be a $362.58 per day daily rate. Then to take that, that daily rate and then break it down to an hourly, you then would take that daily, multiply it by the hours they work, 7.5, and it comes out to a per hour pay rate. But in this example, the employer actually reports a monthly pay rate. Next slide, please. So here's an incorrect example of how we oftentimes see the monthly pay rate reported. Now, this is gonna be a, a little confusing because you're gonna say, well, Brad, this is the true math. This is really how it's calculated. And I understand that. And that is, it, it is correct math. However, per the government code I showed you earlier, it must be converted at 40 because a pay rate should always be based on a 40 hour equivalent full-time pay rate, regardless of what their schedule is. So here's the incorrect example that we see quite, quite commonly. So you had that annual amount I showed you on the previous slide. You divide it by 12, the person works 12 months, comes up with a monthly pay rate of $7,855.96 per month. So since the person truly say works 37 hours per week, their, you know, their earnings are matching their pay rate. So the monthly pay rate, 7,855.96, the earnings, that's what that, that E means, earnings. You, know, you divide the pay rate by the earnings and behold, the member gets a full month every month. CalPERS does cap out 10 months equals one year. So you know, even though you still pay contributions for the full 12 months and it helps fund the plan, we cap the person at one year of service. So if this was to stand, this is how we would, we would calc her retirement. I'm just gonna say she retired at age 55 and she's a classic member. So you know her, her benefit factor is 2%. We multiply it by her service credit. Let's say she has 20 years. So that's 40% of her final comp. So 40% of her monthly pay rate is $3,142.38. So, that's her unmodified allowance. And that's what, let's say she chose that option. That's what her allowance would be if it was to stand and be reported like that. Okay, next slide, please. So that was the incorrect example. This is the correct way to do it. So you remember two slides ago, we figured out what that hourly pay rate was. So it was 48.34. Multiply that by what a 40 hour equivalent is. So even though this person didn't really work 
2,080 hours, that's what you need to multiply that hourly by. So 4834 multiplied by 20, 2,080, which is 40 hours per week. And that comes out to an annual of $100,547. So even though that wasn't the true annual paid, that's still what the pay rate needs to be converted at. So you take that annual now, divide it by 12, and you come up with the new monthly pay rate. In this case, it's $8,379.69. So to calculate the service credit, we take the true earnings. So based off what the person truly earned, the 37 and a half hour schedule, they really only earned $7,855.96. You divide that by the monthly pay rate based on 40, and you can see the person now isn't earning a full month. They're earning 0 0.0938, which kind of equates to 93% of a month. This person ends up working 12 months and behold, she still gets the full year of service credit. You know, had, had this person worked half time or whatnot, that's where you would see the change in the service credit. So our service credit is really not impacted, but here's where the impact truly comes into play. So we do that same calc, classic member, 2% at 55 times to 20 years, 40% of final comp. So that person's final comp, let's say they had, they, you know, they worked that monthly pay rate for the full 12 months, Tim's team calculates it. And 40% of that pay rate is now $3,351.88. If you could, could you please go back to the previous slide? So you could see the retirement calc, when it was done improperly, the member's allowance was only 3,142.38. Go back to the next slide. And it increased to 3,351. So about $200 difference in the calculation. So I know that the math seems odd because that wasn't what was truly paid. But per the government code, the pay rate should be um, calculated based on 40. The earnings is where you will capture what they were truly paid. Those earnings will then dictate what the service credit will be. So it can be, it can even out sometimes, especially with part-time members, they might not get as much service credit, but they get the benefits of the final comp. Next slide, please. So I know that was a very complex um, situation. Again, if you need more follow-up information, one, we will have more QA at the end of this, of this C Act today, and I can do my best to answer some of your questions. Though if they are very specific, and you want us to look at something, I'd prefer if you just emailed or sent an email to my team, and then we can break it down for you and send you back an email to help, help explain um, the situation better. Okay, so now moving along to the next topic, reporting issues. And this is a common um, issue that we've talked about at prior CACs and the Ed Forum as well. Next slide, please. So one of the biggest reporting issues that is facing CalPERS today, and this isn't just for our school employers, but for our public agencies as well, is lump sum reporting. Lump sum reporting, a special comp creates retirement calc issues. The most common ones we see for school employers are off salary schedule pays, longevity pays, uniform allowances, and education incentives. Most commonly I've seen is the off salary schedule pay and the longevity pay. Um, this fiscal, this year in particular, we've had quite a few lump sum reporting issues with these two particular special comp items. Next slide, please. Our law 20636.1 and 20630 speaks to how special compensation and pay rate for that matter should always be reported as earned. So in the months that it was truly earned. So for instance, you contract for a, off, or you bargain for an off salary schedule pay, a 6% in lieu of a pay increase. You pay the member in June of 2022. Well, in essence, that 6% was not intended for just June. It was intended for the entire fiscal year. So that's where we want you to use these um, transactions called retro special compensation adjustments. It's just one line you can enter in. You can actually do that in your earned period report as well. And you can spread that out equally over 12 months. The system actually does that for you. So you put in the amount, the total amount, you put the months that it's for, and then when you submit it, it spreads it out equally over those months. 
The one flaw with this transaction is it doesn't span fiscal years. So you'd have to do with the different RSC for separate fiscal years. Next slide, please. So let me illust illustrate an example of why a lump sum creates an issue for CalPERS. So in this example, every December, School X, a fictitious school, reports a $1,200 lump sum longevity payment for Johnny Member. Johnny Member decides he was gonna retire in July 1 of 2022. He's 55 years old and he has a classic formula. The pay rate's 5,000 bucks. So School X, they're smart about it and they go, well, we report this every December, but we know that Johnny still earned another six months of longevity. So we're gonna do a lump sum of six months of that longevity in June because he's retiring. Next slide, please. So here's kind of a rough, rough uh, illustration of their payroll reporting. Um, you can see here on 12-1 of 2021 on that first line, they reported his monthly pay rate, his earnings, and his special comp for longevity, the $1,200. But then from January to May, you see that there's zeros. I left April, March, April, and May off just because I didn't have the size on the slide, but just assume that it continued on. But then on June of uh, 2022, they reported those additional six months of longevity pay because they knew the member should receive that. So that's the, that's the illustration. Next slide, please. So our system, when you submit the retirement app, it trolls through our data and it actually finds your highest 12 months for your final comp. So it trolls and it finds the, late, the last 12 months for the um, final comp period, 7 one to June 30 of 2022. Next slide, please. So if you recall on that payroll illustration, there's actually two lump sums reported there. There's six months in June, the $600. And then in December, there's 12 months, a special comp, the $1,200. So this member, instead of receiving $1,200 to be added into his final comp calc, he's going to get $1,800. So that's $600 more than what he should be receiving. Next slide, please. So this is how we would calculate it. We take his pay rate of 5,000, we take the $1,800, divide it by 12 to come up with a longevity pay average of 150 bucks. His final comp now is $5,150. If you do the retirement calc, the benefit factor times the service credit, you'll see he gets 50% of his allowance and his monthly allowance is now 2,575. So that's if the lump sum was reported and it stood and um, CalPERS was not able to catch it at the time of retirement. So this member now is on roll with $2,575. Okay, so that was an improper lump sum reporting. So here's how it should have been reported. And then I'm gonna show you the differences in the calcs. Um, next slide, please. So here's an example of how it should have been reported as earned. So as you can see, the special comp was all spread out to $100 per month. That's why I picked $1,200 to make it easy on the example. But you can see in December, you only see $100. And that's because the 1,200 was spread out for the entire calendar year. So if I was to show you November or October, you'd see also $100 of special comp and longevity reported. And then likewise, from January to June, it's spread out $100 per month. So next slide, please. So because it was spread out appropriately, the member only got $1,200 of special comp as he was supposed to. You divide that by 12 to get the average of your longevity. And you can see now the final comp is slightly less at $5,100. And uh, you run the calc through with the same details. And the member now is getting a $2,550 a month allowance. Next slide, please. So I did a side-by-side -side comparison and you can see that with the lump sum reported, the member's retirement allowance now is $25 higher than it should have been. So let's just say that this was caught on a, a, a CalPERS audit three years later. You know, for whatever reason, it took three years to have it get caught again. Well, if you take those overpayments 
of $25 and you multiply it out by those three years, you can see that there's an overpayment of 900 bucks. So the member would lose $25 per month on his allowance and he'd owe us $900 in return. Now this is kind of a low end example. I've seen some that have been much, much higher than this. I've seen overpayments that have been anywhere between five to $10,000 or downward adjustments that you know be 50 to 100 which can really impact a member's uh, livelihood, right? Like they made lifetime decisions based on these calculations. Um, so it's very important that when you report special comp, it's not reported as a lump sum. Next slide, please. Um, reporting lump sums creates tons of issues. One was the one I just showed you where the person is calculated incorrectly and could be captured in an audit and have a costly overpayment. Um, it also it creates delays in retirement payments, right? Um, you know, we've been really cognizant of this issue. So we've done our best to try to capture these when they happen. But when they do happen, it either requires the employer to go in and fix their payroll data. And so it posts properly so we can calculate. Or um, our, our BSD, our Retirement Benefit Services Division, will end up having to do a manual calculation. Or my team, the comp review team, will have to go out there and spread the payments out for you, um, you know, which which creates a lot of work, especially during crunch time. You know, this, this, this year we've had a real big uptick in retirements and it's created some delays in our payments because we've had to try to um, smooth out some of this data or work with you to fix it. So, um, you know, keep that in mind whenever you report lump sums that it can create a lot of different issues for CalPERS. But I will say I've added in a new payroll rule that's gonna be coming in January that should help, help with this issue. Next slide, please. Um, the circular letter for this was actually just sent out, I want to say last week. I think it was last week. <laughs> um, either that or it was early this week. Regardless, it's out there. Um, so we created a new business rule. It's actually an existing business rule that we implemented back in April or March of, of last year. It created a lot of issues. Um, there were some defects associated with that. Well, we've cleaned all of that up now. And what will happen come January, it's gonna be January 15th is when it, it goes in our system. I think that the Monday following the 18th is when you guys will probably see it, but regardless, it's gonna go in over that weekend. And the way it's gonna work is if you, so every special comp type, we've set thresholds um, based off of data that we have back at CalPERS on what, what we believe the appropriate compliance level for each of our special comp items is. So if you report a special comp item as a lump sum, most likely it will exceed a threshold. For instance, OSSP, off salary schedule paid. That one I could tell you the threshold 6% because in the law, that's the highest you could report is 6%. So if you were to report an off salary schedule pay all 12 months in one month, it will definitely exceed that 6%. So when it exceeds that 6%, you're going to get this um, error code CRB00357. And it's gonna let you know that you reported as a lump sum and that you should spread it out appropriately. The other thresholds, unfortunately, I cannot share. They're all proprietary information. Um, you know, we, we can't really share that. We don't want um, employers to catch wind of what it is. Perhaps if they, if they wanted to, they could game the system. They would know what our thresholds are and report underneath them, um, things of that nature. I know no one here would ever do that. And I'm not accusing anyone of that, but it is proprietary information. Um, having said that, if you, do, if you do get this payroll error when we go live with this and you feel that your item is compliant with CalPERS and it just exceeded the threshold, please let us know. We'll take a look at it. We'll confirm that that item is above threshold and should be reported in the percentage it is. And we will find a way in which to have that payroll post. Um, in the next year or so, we are going to have an enhancement for that. So where we can set the rules specific to each employer. Um, at this first go around, it's probably going to require some behind the scenes um, for us to get those posted in those rare situations, um, but we will be able to accommodate you the best that we can on that. This role right now is set as an exception, so you could run an exception report now to see if you already are encountering this issue. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so I'm now gonna turn it over to Tim Herbeck and he's gonna talk about timely retirement payments. Thank you, Brad. Okay, so um, I believe everybody can hear me now. 
Um, I want to talk to you about the time of retirement payments. And as we continue going through um, this fiscal year, uh, it is, you know, we're kind of starting to be, well, we're starting to enter into our busy time for retirements. Most people retire uh, in December uh, for public agency and state. I know schools, the biggest retirement time is generally June, July. But what we've discovered is over the last year or so, there have been a number of issues that really have prevented uh, members from receiving their benefits timely and in actually being paid accurately. And, and due to these discrepancies or these delays, we have since received a number of uh, escalated calls, um, submitted inquiries, emails, letters uh, from members who are just questioning why either A, uh, their benefits being delayed by sometimes 30, 60 days, or why their benefit is not matching what they got at the estimate. So for this part, I want to kind of talk to you uh, as an employer. I know normally my questions and answers are directed to members. And if any of you are looking to retire within the next year, this is really relevant to you. Um, but this is as an employer, how could you help us uh, ensure that as people retire, they get the benefit that they deserve in a timely fashion? Next slide, please. So what are some of the most common reasons a retirement benefit payment may be delayed? And I'll kind of go into this a little bit more and kind of show you some of the screens that we have internally that help calculate a retirement. But the biggest is fluctuating pay rate types. Because whenever we see fluctuating pay rate types, it triggers what we would consider a exception, exception message. Think of it the same way as your error messages when reporting payroll. We also get exception messages when trying to calculate a retirement. Uh, we would prefer that all retirements, um, the applications would come in and they would then just be a fly through. What we would consider an application come in, we just wait to the retirement date and they get paid out. But as soon as we have these exception messages, we hold our retirement calculation to provide further review. So fluctuating pay rate types are the number one reason why we get these exception messages. Different pay rate types reported for summer session. Uh, this is more specifically to schools because as Brad just um, discussed, as you report compensation, regardless of it's one day or two days worked, five days worked in a month, you have to report those to us for service. Uh, so the pay rates we see a lot of times are different because you consider a summer session work versus the normal calendar school year work, but they're not really doing anything different. The duties are not being different. And actually, if you convert the hourly pay rate that you're reporting for the summer session uh, it is very close to maybe the monthly pay rate that you would report uh, during the normal school year uh, using the 173.33 you know, conversion factor. But because there is a difference and there could be rounding issues, it does delay the timely payments. So different pay rate types. Um, reporting to multiple part-time positions. So this, you know, this makes, I know we have where you have one appointment. And for schools, this is really for you because we don't have this really for the state and public agencies. Um, but because we have somebody who's a crossing guard, we have somebody who's an administrative assistant. I mean, my kids go to school and, and I know the admin person who's in the office uh, is also the person who's doing you know, playground duty during lunchtime. And at three o'clock, they also go out and do crossing duty to ensure the kids cross the street. Uh, for the most part, they have one job. They're just an assistant or they're just a, a school um, admin person, but they perform different duties throughout the day. Uh, so what we see a lot of times in schools is that for each of those duties, you may have different pay rates. Even though it's the same person really just doing functional work at the school, you pay them differently, crossing guard versus yard duty versus in the office doing budgeted work. Uh, but that really does play a role, especially if you get a merit increase or a salary adjustment specific to one position, not the other ones. We don't know how to calculate those pay rate changes. And then fluctuations in special comp reporting, very similar to what Brad just talked about. Uh, if you have, you know, zero, 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 zeros being reported, then all of a sudden this one lump sum of off salary schedule pay, because that's how you chose to bargain and pay your members out as a one time lump sum. Because we have these zeros and all of a sudden this high increase, it creates triggers. So if it's not fluent, if it's not consistent, if it's not routine, 
uh, fluctuating special comps do create a, a restriction for us to review. And then one time payment of special comp, we've already addressed that. And as I'm looking and monitoring some of the questions, I think Brad has an opportunity to kind of talk a little bit more about the one time, uh, especially if they're paid out in July for the upcoming fiscal year, or they're paid out at the end of the year once you have a budgetary surplus and you know you have to get rid of the funds and pay it out, you do it at the end of the year. Uh, but those one times, especially if you do it one year in June and then the next fiscal year in July, and we have these two large lump sums, it really does uh, create havoc on the retirement calc. Next slide, please. So here's an example uh, I wanna show you in regards to fluctuating pay rates uh, impacting the final compensation. So I did grab, this is an actual case uh, we had back in, in uh, June. This person routine and consistently received a monthly pay rate. It is a part-time employee, which is fine, right? We don't calculate, we're not STRS. We don't calculate based on earnings. So even though they're part-time, uh, their hours still reflect a monthly pay rate. It still is a 40 hour work week, still an eight hour day. It doesn't matter if they're full-time or part-time because we don't calculate based on earnings. We calculate based on pay rate. Uh, so that is the biggest difference between us and STRS because working with a lot of reciprocal systems, including STRS, a lot of systems use earnings uh, in order to calculate. They take the total annual earnings, divide by 12, that's how they come up with their final comp value. We don't do that. We use the actual full-time pay rate, earnings derive service credit. So in our formula, we have pay rate times service credit times formula, earnings drive service credit, pay rate gives you what your monthly equivalent should be. So in this case, the monthly full-time pay rate is $4,052. However, you see that it looks like from what I can see in August and September, um, this district, may have had two additional hours worked, three additional hours worked, 10 additional hours worked, whatever it may be. Uh, and so they reported those additional earnings in the same month, but they did it as a 23.38 hourly pay rate. It's no different position, it's just additional earnings. However, in order to report those additional earnings, they changed the pay rate for whatever reason. Next slide, please. Here is what it looks like on our end when we calculate it. Because of rounding, 173.33333, however your payroll system converts, because of the rounding issue, taking that two pay periods at an hourly pay rate actually changed the monthly equivalent from a 40.52 to a 40.52.07. If these two months would have been reported consistently using the 40.52, this would have been a fly through calculation. No eyes needed. It would have just been there. Since retirement date came out, we would have paid on the next payable warrant. But because this district chose for August and for July to change the pay rate type to an hourly equivalent, even though it's very close, it went off by pennies, it triggered a restriction because now it shows between the month of July 2020 and June 2021, the person's pay rate fluctuated. So again, that's why it's essential that even if you're reporting additional hours work, maybe the district comes to you and says, oh, we forgot 10 extra hours or we need to deduct 10 extra hours. Do not convert the pay rate from the actual full-time monthly pay rate or whatever you normally and consistently routinely use for reporting payroll. Next slide, please. Here's another example of a case that we identified that really um, changed or prevented us from accurately uh, calculating this member's retirement. So in this case, routinely and consistently a monthly pay rate of 6,516. But for whatever reason, for January, they may have picked up an additional job. They may have done additional duties. And so Here's a reporting error where they gave us a monthly pay rate type of $375.93, earnings of $375.93. It doesn't look like this would really make that big a difference because again, for most of you, you're looking at earnings. But what this really does is it gives this part-time member full-time service credit for the months of October or November and for the month of January. 
They're getting now more service credit than what they deserved. Plus, it's going to negatively impact their final comp because we average. We're going to take for January 6516 plus 375 and divide by two. You know, it's a high level. We do a little bit more formula, including earnings, but at a high level, we would average that, bringing that pay rate for January down. And the same thing for that November period. Next slide, please. So when you look at our calcs, this is what it looks like. All of a sudden, we're looking at three months or 30, three years worth of payroll. So we have 18 months at 65.16. We have one month of $375, one month of 65.16, another month of 138, and 65.16. When we actually calculated this case because it all looked correct, and unfortunately, we didn't really do too much dive into it, we actually released this case with a member's lower service, uh, lower monthly pay rate. But once we actually contacted, in this case, the, I think it was a um, public agency, and they corrected and backed out these reported pay rates. One, yes, the service credit went up, um, the pay, pay rate went up, but the service credit went down. And this member actually got more in retirement because again, that full service credit was there. When they backed it out, it reduced it. So even though the monthly full-time average went up, the service credit went down. And this person actually had to cut us a check for approximately $4,000 by the time we caught this because we overpaid them due to these two uh, misreported pay rates. So you can see as we average and calculate, it's not that we just use earnings. We actually use every monthly full-time equivalent to calculate a person's one year or 36 month final comp. And we use it all and we only focus on pay rates and we do average things out. We don't just take the highest, right? If say, for example, uh, for one pay period, the member had a pay rate of 65.16 and $4,000 in earnings, and then a pay rate of, say, $6,700 and only $1,000 earnings, we're not using the $6,700 monthly pay rate as the highest pay rate because they really didn't contribute and earn a benefit on $6,700 for the entire month. Majority of their service credit was off of 65.16. So we have to average and weight it out to get a correct uh, funded full-time monthly equivalent. And that's some of the questions we get from members as well as employers is that they believe whatever their highest pay rate is, regardless of its multiple pay rates and earn period, unless it's a retro salary adjustment, but if it's multiple earn period pay rates that we would use the highest in their calculation and not average it out. And that's just not true. We truly look at all reported monthly full-time pay rates and we average it out based on the month and service they have within their one year or three year uh, period of time, however we calculate the retirement. Next slide, please. Uh, so with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Brad. I believe you have some questions and some maybe some additional slides. I do. Thank you, Tim. Okay, and so the last topic I'm going to discuss today, and Andrea um, kind of touched on this a little bit earlier, is about new legislation that passed with Cal, um, for CalPERS law, um, and in particular, I want to talk about uh, SB 278. Next slide, please. Okay, um, so um, we're working on a circular letter for this one, too. It's actually making the rounds right now, and um, it should be coming out in the next three, four weeks. Um, and I know we've talked about this at previous uh, school employer advisory meetings and at the Ed Forum, some webinars we've been doing as well. Um, but um, SB 278 indeed did pass. It's actually the government, it's going to be government code 20164.5. And so I'm just going to give you some high level bullets. Um, SB 278 20164.5 addresses disallowed compensation for benefit adjustments. It establishes a procedure for determinations made on or after 1117 with what we call disallowed compensation. It redirects responsibility on employers to make members whole by covering the overpayment and a portion of the annuity due to reduction in benefits. Also within the law, it allows the opportunity for employers to submit their labor policy or agreement to CalPERS. We can then review it and then give you an official determination on if the um, compensation item in question is indeed something pensionable with CalPERS. So let me illustrate um, in high level how this is gonna work. 
Um, go ahead and um, go to the next slide, please. So, you know, we talk about disallowed compensation. So what does that mean? So disallowed compensation is actually gonna be anything that's in your MOU or bargaining agreement, labor agreement. Actually, no, I'm going backwards on this. I'm sorry, I did this backwards. Um, let me back up here for a second. Um, so items considered disallowed compensation are uh, non-compliant special comp items, including your labor agreement or MOU. The member was placed on roll with a non-compliant special comp item, and it was discovered after the member was placed on roll. So for an example, let's say that you in your bargaining agreement have a longevity plan, but that longevity plan was not set up appropriately. It was only available to people that were at the top step of uh, their range, which is something that's not reportable for CalPERS. Or let's say that they you offer the longevity plan, but you didn't have the proper steps in there, or perhaps it was for less than five years. Those are all things laid out in the government code. However, you still negotiated for it. It was added as part of your labor agreement and you reported to CalPERS. The member, all along was receiving payments for this longevity pay. It was being reported to CalPERS. So that non-compliant item got through the door. It actually got placed on retirement roll for the member. And now um, they're getting paid for a benefit they never should have received. So if we discover this after the member's placed on roll, like through an audit, that's when disallowed compensation would come into play. And I'm gonna show you how that penalty works the next few slides. So just to recap, you have a non-compliant item in your MOU or labor agreement. It was reported to CalPERS. The member was placed on roll with that benefit and then it was caught after the fact. That's disallowed compensation in a nutshell. Next slide, please. Disallowed compensation though is not items that were due to payroll reporting errors. So say that you, like the, like the issue I brought up earlier, um, where the pay rates get converted inappropriately. That is not considered disallowed compensation. That's more considered like a payroll keying error. Or say you reported a monthly rate as an hourly. We'll catch those 99% of the times, but something like that, that's a payroll reporting error, not considered disallowed compensation. Lump sum reporting, the issue we talked about also earlier with um, you know, OSSP in particular, or longevity payments. Even though that's a big no-no, it's still not considered disallowed compensation. Though all, basically, anything that was considered a payroll reporting error is not something that would be considered disallowed compensation. And then the one little nuance to this is that, you know, within our law also, special compensation items cannot be reported solely in the final comp period. So for example, if you offered up an off-salary schedule pay, and say it was a compliant off salary schedule pay, you know, it, it crossed all the T's, dotted all the I's, and it was something you should report. Well, if a member retires with that off salary schedule pay and it was only reported ever once in their final comp period, it's reportable. It just can't be used in their final comp calculations. So in instances like that, that also would not be considered disallowed compensation. It was a reportable item. We just couldn't use it in the calc because it was only in the final comp period. So if it's in your bargaining agreement and it's something non-compliant and the member goes on roll with it, disallowed comp. If it's a payroll reporting issue, one of the things you see on the screen here, it would not be considered disallowed compensation. Next slide, please. Okay, one of my lovely examples. So we have a member, their allowance is $5,500 per month. However, this allowance includes $500 of disallowed comp. So it was one of those items in the MOU that should have never been there, never should have been reported to us, and never should have been put on roll. And this person's been receiving $5,500 per month for the last three years. Next slide, please. So this member gets, um, it's part of an audit. You know, your, your school gets audited. They have that bad longevity pay in there. And um, we have to correct it. We have the duty to correct. So Kevin's team, um, the MOU review team, uh, audit team, they work with you. They have you back out that $500 all the way back to the retirement date. But what does that do? Well, that creates an overpayment for the member. So $500 times 36 months 
is $1,800 or $18,000. So part of this law would be if it was disallowed, comp or, yeah, disallowed compensation, the employer would have to pay that full $18,000. You know, right now, like if it's one of those payroll reporting issues, the member would pay the full 18,000. The employer only pays anything over three years. So if this overpayment was for five years and say it was uh, $36,000, you would only pay the excess over the 18. But this law will change that. If it's considered disallowed comp, you'd pay that full overpayment. And this is just kind of a rough example. If that member received any cost of living adjustments, which every year after the second year you retire, you receive a cost of living adjustments, those all get wrapped up into this overpayment as well. So one, the employer pays the overpayment for the downward adjustment going back to their retirement date. Next slide, please. Additionally, there's another penalty associated with this too. So the downward adjustment, the amount the, the member is going to be losing that $500. So we're taking away $500 per month from their check. So the ongoing for the rest of their life, that will also a portion that will have to be accountable to the employer as well. So the law talks about it's a 20% penalty of that ongoing amount. So the member now is not gonna get that extra 500 bucks, but 20% of that's gonna have to be covered by you, the employer. So 20% of $500 is a hundred bucks. This is where it gets a little tricky. And I can't really give you a good example because this calc will vary from member to member based on actuarial factors. So we'll turn this information over to our actuary team They'll take that $100 and they're gonna multiply it by the actuarial factor. The actuarial factor is based on many different variables. Um, for instance, life expectancy, um, the type of uh, benefit formula the person has. Um, there, there's many different factors that go into the way they calculate this. Um, to make it easy, I just said $100 multiplied by the actuarial factor gives you 100 AF. I'm doing a little algebra here this morning. So 100 AF. So that actuarial factor times that is your, your AF. And so whatever that is, now you, the employer, will get a figure from CalPERS and you will have to pay the member whatever that lump sum is. So you take this $100, say the life expectancy is 25 years, right? It's probably going to be more than this, but you know it could be $2,500 that you have to pay the lump sum. It could be much higher than that too. It really just depends on whatever that actuarial factor is. So as you can see, it could be a very costly pen penalty. Additionally, part of that 20%, 10% of that $100, so $10 of it basically, um, as a lump sum, part of that will be paid to CalPERS for the administrative costs of upholding this law. Next slide, please. So just to recap, if it's disallowed compensation, you're gonna have to, you'll have to cover the entire overpayment and make up for the ongoing downward adjustment, which will be based on actuarial factors. So please do your best to make sure that you contact us if you want us to look at any um, new compensation items you're planning on add to your labor agreement or bargaining agreement. Um, that way we can help you avoid getting any of these penalties in the future. So, you, you know, we've talked about this team a million times before, the MOU review team, that's at mailbox, um, MOU underscore review at calpers.ca.gov. You can submit your labor agreements, MOU there, we can do those reviews for you. And then additionally, we created this web page. Um, it's an informational page on compliance and compensation reporting. So if you go to our external web page, it's under employers and policies and procedures. On the right-hand side, you'll see it says compliance and compensation reporting. You would click on that and it gives you a whole ton of different information. It talks about pertinent laws for compensation. It has sample languages for specific special comp items. Um, has pay, it actually has pay schedule examples. Um, there's some commonly, um, basically some commonly asked questions but they're put more statements into the website. Um, so, so you can kind of see the things that people are asking us and the common answers that we have. Next slide, please. Uh, I thought I added it. And there's also a compensation reportability table. It's a really cool table. It has our five different categories for special comp. You could type in the type you're looking for. It'll let you know if it is reportable to CalPERS for classic or PEPRA members. And it also gives you some valuable information about um, you know, how, how you should have it in your labor agreement. 
So um, if you're looking for more information about anything that we, we talked about today, um, here's some of our common resources. You know, we have our CalPERS webpage. That's what I just mentioned. Of course, we always have the public employer's retirement law. There are online versions. We have the PA and school reference guide, our many circulators, which are also housed on CalPERS website. We have that MOU review web, um, MOU review calpers.ca.gov um, email box, which goes directly to my team so they can assist you with those reviews. And then we also have our outreach mailbox as well. And then the good old call center too, which they can answer actually quite a few of your questions as well. Now I know that we're pressed for time. So I think we're gonna move on to the next presenter, but at the end of the session today, Christine and I will be doing QA. So if you wanna ask some of your comp questions, then please feel free to do so. All right, everybody, um, have a great day and I'll see you at the end. Um, go ahead, Michelle, take it away. All right, thank you, Brad. Um, we're running, as Brad said, a little pressed for time. So we're gonna go ahead and break right now. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Susan and then I'll pick up where we left off after a break. Go ahead, Susan. Yes, yes, thank you, Michelle. Um, we're gonna break for 10 minutes. So let's meet back here at 1041. Okay, thank you, see you then.
All right, we are back. Thank you. Um, we're going to get started again now. And um, Michelle, you have the floor. Okay, thank you so much, Susan. Hello, everyone. I'm happy to be with you today and go over some recent recent enhancements as well as a glimpse into what's coming as it relates to membership. Next slide, please. All right, based on feedback from employers, we've been working hard creating enhancements to our service credit purchase certification process. One thing is being that we now have the ability to see the status of your submitted request at the time throughout the certification process. So anytime that you have a certification that you're submitted, you can see the status of that at any time, which I know can be very helpful to you. This will also allow you to check it um, and have any, any person with appropriate access be able to see where it is in the process. The second one is that you will now get notified when there is a service credit purchase pending for you to complete a certification. These would be requests that were initiated through Member Self Serve or MSS, which is also very helpful. In addition, you will notice a notify option on the certification page that shows the participant employer name and start and end date. So that, that's the page that you will see in the certification. Uh, that also has that notify option that's now available. Since a rear notific rear's notification gets sent to the parent agency, when this option is selected, it will send a notification to the child agency to notify them of the arrears review that is pending and that action needs to be taken, um, which is also a lot of feedback that we received from the employer. So we're happy to oblige and put those implementations in. Next slide, please. One of the biggest enhancements also was implemented based on the feedback from last year when we implemented the automated certification process was that we were able to work swiftly and come up with another option for you to submit your payroll for service credit purchase request as well as the arrears payroll. This is called the employment certification upload functionality. CalPERS implemented this back in September, which was just a few months ago. And now you have a few ways to submit your pay payroll to us without having to enter each payroll in separately. The three options I'm referring to is manually by pay period, which you're, I'm sure you're all familiar with, um, an XML option, and then now the new method of using a CSV file upload. So I'm gonna go ahead and take an opportunity to post some information into chat um, that will be helpful to you. So you can go ahead and refer there, to, refu, refer to the chat for the information. But on the CalPERS website at the top, you will go to the employers on the top screen and then go down to technical requirements, technical resources, expand the toolkit. And there you're going to see a, a zip file. If you open that zip file, you can see a sample, uh, a sample CSV that you are able to fill out or see what it looks like. In addition, you can go to the review data elements PDF, which explains exactly what is needed for that file for it to be able to be uploaded. So all the information that you need should be in there. You can also refer back to our circular letter that explains it more, which is 200-05821. It will be in the resources below for you to refer back to. Um, and it's also in our student guide. All right, next slide, please. Okay, just to show you what the screen looks like, I've attached a screen capture. Within the create or edit report section of the certification, select the upload file from the method drop down list. You will see under the method upload file showing on the screen. You select the file and then you select upload. We did take the opportunity with the enhancement to also update the student guide, which I just explained. I'm sure you're all familiar with it. It's called the Employment Certification Functionality Student Guide. We update this quite frequently, so please make sure that you're checking back in at that student guide for the, the latest updates. Uh, the last time that it was updated was on uh, September 25th, and it should contain all of the information needed to successfully upload a CSV file for your payroll. Next slide, please. 
Some additional notes to point out that is important is that you ensure that your file was able to upload correctly. Once you have uploaded your file, there should be a pre-processing area at the bottom right-hand side of the page. Go to the payroll reporting link and see what the status is of your uploaded file. You should see it very visibly that if there is errors and what the status of the error is. Please note all errors must be cleared in order for the payroll to get uploaded correctly on the certification. The student guide will help if you run into any errors or if you're having trouble correcting them. We are finding that is usually an input error or formatting inconsistencies. Um, again, the student guide will is posted on this slide. It's also at the end of this presentation. Um, and if you get stuck, you can always call the contact center and they will be able to walk you through as well. Next slide, please. All right, so moving on to future enhancements. Again, based on employer feedback, we listened and we're taking action. Within the next few months, we will be providing additional fields on the certification screen. screens. The details such as the member's email address and their phone number will be pulled directly from what is available in the MyCalPERS account, allowing the employers to easily reach out to the members for any questions or if any further information is needed as it relates to their SPM request such as their social security number or CID, so you know who they are and can effectively access their employment and payroll records, allowing you to complete their certification, which I know sometimes can be a challenge when you don't know who they are because maybe they don't work for you anymore. <laughs> um, we're asking for you to complete all fields in the certification requiring if required if you use them in order for us to accurately complete all service purchase credit requests such as time base, CBU class code, reportable earnings, pay rate. We are working on making some of these mandatory fields in the future, but it's very helpful if you do provide that information upfront for us to easily complete the request, whether it be a SPM request, um, service credit purchase, or an arrears review. Next slide, please. Now that we've covered the recent enhancements and future enhancements for membership, I wanted to go over a few reminders. In order to complete any certification for a service credit purchase or an arrears review, you need to have the correct role established in your MyCalPERS account. We are finding that there are many certifications that we sent out that are left incomplete or have never been responded to. If you are curious if your school has any on file, let me know and I can pull a report for you um, or you can access it by pulling a Cognos report yourself. Um, it's called Business Partner CalPERS User Access Reports. Or you can see in the contact section of your agency's uh, account, by going into contacts, you can click on, uh, you can click in there and see exactly what roles that you have or what you don't have. But just to note that you do need uh, to have a business partner arrears role. At, everyone needs to have that role in addition to one of the below. So one of the following roles you need to have added, depending on what your function is with your agency. So either payroll or retirement enrollment. Um, so make sure that those are set up and then you can actually see what certifications are pending for you to complete. Pull the Cognos report so you can see, see it there, um, or you can ask me and I can easily send you a report, whatever is easier for you. Uh, next, next slide, please. Additional reminders, to prevent delays with all certifications and best assist our members, please make sure the following information is provided upfront on all certifications, as I stated before. We are continuously updating our automation and in turn increasing our efficiencies to be able to process work quicker with no errors while maintaining our data integrity. So what we need, dates of employment, position title, time base, tenure, months worked per year, options to upload supporting hiring documents, which we highly recommend that you do to support the maybe an arrears certification, um, and then also the service period details. 
When these fields are missing, it will stop the process until they are completed by the employer. It is important that a timely response is received in order for us to fulfill the member's request. It is equally important that the information we received is valid and correct on the certification to prevent any financial impacts to the member when they go to retire. Next slide, please. All right. So I've tried to make this short and sweet for you. I have listed some helpful resources for you to utilize and refer back to as needed. I've listed the circular letter, which ends in the two zero, which is the employment certification functionality that we rolled out last year. Also the circular letter ending in 21 is the certification upload functionality that I went over. Um, the student guide with step-by-step -step instructions for both the ARREA certification and the service credit purchase request certifications are also listed there for you to refer back to. We are in the process of making more updates to that student guide, so please look out for, for that as uh, the future enhancements go into place. Uh, there'll be more information in that student guide for you to review. Um, if you haven't had time to validate your role in my CalPERS, please re also refer to the student guide on page one or the circular letter ending in two zero on page two. There's specific instructions on how to do that. Uh, look into your CalPERS account in your contact section, as I stated before, or you can always run that Cosmos report. Please contact the contact center for any additional information. And as always, we are here to help you and answer any questions that you might have. Um, and as you guys know, I am always available if, um, if you need that additional assistance. Are there any questions that I can help answer? Thank you, Michelle. Hi, everyone. Good morning, this is Ron Ashcraft. I'm an analyst here on the membership review team. We had a couple questions that came in that I answered in the Q&A. Uh, we do have one right now that hasn't been answered yet. And it's from Debbie Hackenberg. And she asked, I was told by an employee that they received a letter from CalPERS stating that it is the employer that is to submit the request for service credit information for the employee. Did she misunderstand? I thought the employee is to start this process first. Hi, Debbie. Uh, I can go ahead and answer that, Ron. Thank you so much for the question, Debbie. Um, you're correct. If they can actually submit it two different ways, preferably it would through, be through the MM, MSS tool, the member self-serve. They initiate the request to the employer. The employer should receive that in their tool by getting notified, and then they complete the actual certification, including all of the payroll information. Um, the second way is if they submit a form. Um, which is they would just fill out a paper form or um, an online form, and then they would email it to the employer. And then the employer would insert everything into the system through automation. So there's two different ways. We do highly recommend the automated way where the employer, the member, sorry, starts through MSS. Thanks for the question. Thank you. There's a few more. Uh, Monica is asking, how are arrears requests found? What prompts these to be entered in the member request area? Mike can clarify that if you'd like, Michelle, or you can. Um, sure. Um, so how the arrears found is you would just go into your my um, CalPERS account under that member and find and they would be in there. Um, we can help you with that, Monica. If you reach out to me, I can send you some screen captures of what that looks like, or you can refer back to your the student guide. There's actually screenshots in there that shows you. And how they're prompted is uh, several different ways how they can be. Um, the first one is through the um, service credit purchase request. If there is a service credit purchase request coming in, um, more than likely, it's going to need an arrears review. So we make sure that the member is whole and they have everything that they need for that calculation to be accurate. Um, so that's the majority of requests that we receive over in my team for the membership review from an arrears perspective. It stems from that service credit purchase request that was initiated. 
Um, on the flip side, outside of that, um, there are several reasons why it could prompt uh, an arrears review from my team. Either the member called into our contact center and asked some questions, and they sent it over to us to do a review, a cursory review of the account, and then therefore we're going to in turn ask for the employer to provide us some additional information. Um, but there's, um, there's many other reasons that does prompt a review, and I believe that's also listed on the student guide as well, Monica. But again, you can always reach out to me if you're having trouble, and I can assist you. Okay, Michelle, we do have, um, Vina is online and would like to ask a question. Go ahead, Vina. Vina, you can unmute yourself now. Okay. Vina, if you want to um, ask a question, go ahead and type it into the Q&A box. Okay. Oh, are you there, Vina? Yeah. Oh, okay. Can you hear me? Um, barely. Okay. Um, I would like to say my question so that um, if you can hear me, I'll type it in. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. In two thousand. Yeah, it's probably yeah. It's probably best if you type it in. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Michelle. Okay, so I see one from Patty. How do they submit online if it is prior PERS entity that they worked for? Do they submit the paper form or for the entity and not online? I they can help clarify. I'm sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, Ron. I was gonna help clarify that. So if Patty's referring to how they, as the employee or the member, submits that online. If it's obviously, I think she's talking about a service prior to membership request. And again, that member is to begin it online on their own MyCalPERS login account, and then they submit it over to the appropriate employer to complete and then submit to CalPERS for review. Patty, hopefully that answers your question. I also just wanted mm -hmm. to chime in again on top of Monica's question that you answered. Uh, that is uh, found in the student guide um, on page 21 is how to go in and view arrears determinations. Um, just to clarify, it's not going to look as a request for you. It, once, once you submit the requested employment certification, no matter how it was generated, then here in membership, we will do a review for membership. And if necessary, we then determine an arrears. And that is when at that point, you will be able to go into your account and view the arrears determination and take a couple different options there. Uh, one being a reconsideration request, if you disagree with it, and one also being the ability to waive the 30 day appeal period, should our member perhaps be uh, uh, urgently trying to retire. All right. have... Okay, thank you so much for that additional information. Ron, we're gonna go ahead and stop there. If there's any further questions, we can always answer them after the SEAC today. Thanks everybody for your time. I appreciate it. I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to Ryan Beaker and Megan Corte to go over my CalPERS enhancements. Thanks everyone. All right, good morning. My name is Ryan Beaker and I will be presenting on behalf of the system support team about recent enhancements to the MyCalPERS system. Uh, next slide, please. the contributory notification letter. The purpose of this document is to notify employers that the contributory status of a member's appointment has changed from non-contributory to contributory. So let's say you have a member who works for school district A full-time. Several months later, the same member accepts a part-time position at school district B. 
The part-time position at School District B should be a non-contributory appointment. If the member separates from School District A, the contributory notification letter would be sent to School District B, letting School District B know that the non-contributory status of the appointment at School District B has changed to a contributory appointment, and contributions are now expected for this appointment. This letter will be sent to the school district, and a uh, courtesy copy will be sent to the COE and the employee. If the employee accepts a full-time position back at school district A, CalPERS will send the overtime non-contributory letter after review is completed, and the part-time appointment at school district B should no longer be contributory. The contact person name in the letter will be populated based off the primary payroll contact. If there's no primary payroll contact, then we will use the first payroll contact in the list of contacts. If there are no payroll contacts for the employer, then we'll use the human resources contact, then the general contact. Uh, next, we have the employer certification mass upload. Um, we have recently enhanced the MyCalper system to accept CSV documents to certify arrear pay periods by both the COE and the school districts. These CSV documents are commonly created in Microsoft Excel and can contain multiple arrear periods for several different members at a time. Circular letter 200-058-21 discusses the new employment certification functionality in detail if you would like more information. Uh, as Michelle was saying, we have several different online resources that can assist in the creation of a CSV document. Within the circular letter, underneath the additional resources section, you could click the technical resources hyperlink. From there, you could open our payroll tab, and within the payroll tab, we have a CalPERS review CSV report document. We also list the CalPERS review PDF, but this is designed to cater for those employers who upload using an XML format. So make sure you click on the right one. Within the technical toolkit section, we list an employer's technical toolkit that you can download and find an example of the CS CSV documents as well. There are several different types of examples within that toolkit, so make sure you select the right example file. Once you've created your CSV document, we highly encourage you to try and upload this document in our test environment. The test environment has no connection to the actual MyCalPERS website, so no late fees, arrears, or penalties will occur from anything you do in the test environment. If you can access the normal MyCalPERS website, you should be able to log into the test environment using your same login credentials. Next slide, please. Lastly, we have a few reminders I'd like to point out before I conclude the presentation from system support. The undeliverable address Cognos report. It is important that member addresses are maintained to ensure that they receive timely communication from CalPERS. You are encouraged to generate the undeliverable address Cognos report frequently to determine if your employees have missing or undeliverable addresses in my CalPERS. Primary contact. To ensure the appropriate contacts receive timely communication from CalPERS, it is important for your agency to have a primary contact type for all of the roles relevant to your agencies. When a primary contact type is identified, my CalPERS will generate notifications to them, generally based on a preferred method of communication. Contact tabs are not required to have access to my CalPERS. If your primary contact does not have system access, their preferred method of communication should be mail. It is important to note that system access rules is not related to the contact types. Retirement appointment reconciliation, everyone's favorite subject. To avoid late fees and other related fees, we highly encourage that your staff regularly address the appointments listed in the retirement appointment reconciliation pages to account for appointments with unposted payroll. You should regularly be maintaining these enrollments by completing appointment events, like placing someone on a leave of absence, or permanently separating the appointments, confirming unposted payroll, or identifying appointments that need to be researched later. This concludes my presentation for system support. Do we have any questions? Ryan, I think we're gonna go ahead and go on. Um, yes. We're okay. running a little bit behind. All right, in that case, I'm gonna turn it over to Bobby Saturn and help to talk about direct pay. Thank you. All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Bobby Saturn. I am from the Health Account Management Division of CalPERS. For today's presentation regarding health benefits, I'll do a short presentation on the topic of direct pay and it's to explain what direct pay is and who is eligible for this benefit. 
Next slide, please. So what is direct pay? Uh, direct pay is a payment option that is available to active members to continue health coverage while they're on off pay status for one or more full pay periods. This could be when an employee has exhausted all leave credits and are on a temporary sick leave, maternity or paternity leave, pending service retirement, awaiting approval of disability retirement application and so forth. To maintain direct pay health pay, um, sorry, to maintain direct pay health coverage, uh, the employee is responsible for 100% of the health premium and is paid directly to the health plan by the subscriber. The health plan generates a bill monthly that is mailed directly to the subscriber. Next slide, please. So on this page, uh, I captured a screenshot of what our direct pay authorization form is. Um, so in order to enroll into direct pay, a direct payment authorization form, uh, which is called the HBD-21, it must be completed and approved by the employer. If the member has eligible dependents, they can also be included in the coverage. Uh, the member's coverage period has no limitation to how long he or she can be enrolled in direct pay unless the employee is laid off. So when an employee is laid off, um, they have two options. They can either elect direct pay for up to one year or they have the option of COBRA for up to 36 months. Uh, as a note, if an employee elects direct pay, the employee may forfeit their COBRA rights as COBRA should be elected within 60 days of receiving their COBRA notification. So uh, at this time, I'll be taking the time to drop a link to our direct pay authorization form in the chat uh, if you need it. And here is the, the form. And we'll go ahead and go on to the next slide, please. So uh, if an employee is eligible for direct pay and elects to enroll, the member's responsibility is to key the transition in MyCalpers using the appropriate event type and event reason. Uh, the event type you will be using is change premium payment method, and the event reason will, you will use is to change to direct pay other. Members on direct pay have similar responsibilities as if they are still on active pay status. Uh, members can add newly acquired dependents, um, they can delete family members, they can change their health plans during open enrollment, or if they have like a change of address, and they, are, they can cancel coverage at any time. If a dependent is deleted, they can be re-enrolled during open enrollment or as a result of a quali qualifying event, such as if they were to lose other coverage elsewhere. Um, next slide, please. So this concludes my presentation on direct pay. Uh, do we have any questions? So I do see a couple of questions here in the Q&A. Um, looks like Mary asks, is this only for participants that are enrolled in CalPERS health plans? So yes, that's correct. This is only for participants that are enrolled um, or are eligible for health through CalPERS. Looks like Jacqueline is asking for this slide. Um, I believe this should be included uh, with the whole slide. And Teresa is asking, is there any circular letter sent out covering the health direct pay player responsibilities? So that I'm not sure. Um, I can get back to you on that one. Um, and if I do find that circular letter, I can send, send you a direct link to that. And um, if we do not have any further questions, we'll go ahead and proceed. Uh, I'll pass it on to Christina Williams for our Ed Forum recap. Hi, good morning, everyone. I'm hoping you guys can hear me. Um, I just wanted to give you guys a quick recap of our educational forum that we had this year. Um, I'm sure most of you or a lot of you attended it. Um, as you probably know at this point or have heard us throughout the years, the CalPERS Educational Forum is really like our Super Bowl for the division. It's our division plans almost a year and ahead for this event, and we just work so hard in developing content for um, all of our employers that um, is usually based on current topics or areas that we feel need um, more education. 
So this was our second year of hosting this as a virtual event, and we had record attendance in all of our sessions. So CalPERS, as an organization, we conducted um, almost 20 sessions, and almost half of those um, came from our division, from the Employer Account Management uh, Division. So that was fantastic. Our most popular sessions this year were the MOU labor agreement review, the question and answer session uh, with Brad's team. Um, that session had almost 800 attendees attend. So that uh, was amazing. And um, the other highest one was taking the complexity out of working after retirement. And we had approximately 700 attendees for that presentation. And our other ones, you know, those were the highest, but not by much. We had high attendance of over 500, I think, in at least, I mean, in all of our sessions that were uh, given by our division. So we were so happy to see that um, we received uh, a lot of great questions in that um, in that uh, in the sessions, and so that was great too. We were able to answer the questions. Um, it was just the right amount of time. And for those of you who attended, I hope that you um, enjoyed it as well. We also received a lot of positive feedback and a lot of. Um, positive comments about our content in our sessions this year. And so we really, really appreciated that, knowing that our hard work um, had paid off this year for the Ed Forum um, was great to know and that it was appreciated by all of you as well. So we also had exhibit booths that we offered from our specific program areas to answer specific questions. Those exhibit booths weren't visited as much as we thought they would be, similar to last year, but we're hoping that the reason for that is that the questions that were uh, that you had were answered in the sessions. So the information, the presentations are available still on our website if you were registered um, or attended the Ed Forum, so you're able to get that information as well, the recorded sessions. Um, and next year, we'll be back uh, to our in-person event. So the 2022 CalPERS Ed Forum will be in person again, and it'll be in Anaheim on October 31st and November 1st. Yes, I know that that is Halloween, um, unfortunately, but um, there's no changing on that date. So we will be hopefully seeing most or all of you here today at our ed form in person again um and we're looking we're looking forward to that um i don't know if you guys had any feedback or are there any questions or any feedback you want to provide now while we're um while we're here on the ed forum or something that you didn't get out if you do i'll wait a little while for that if not i can uh, move on Okay, I don't see any questions in the chat. Um, and with that, um, we're running a little bit short on time, but we do have um, a few minutes to answer. Brad, I'll bring uh, Brad Harris, I mean, Brad Hansen back on the video. And Brad and I can do a quick um, question and answer period if you guys have any questions about any of the topics that we cover today at the um, SEAC or any questions that you might have, period, we're here. So um, with that, uh, Brad and I are here. So please feel free to use the chat um, to, uh, or uh, message us and we'll answer any questions that you have. Hey, um, I don't know, if I, can everybody hear me okay? I, I don't see myself on the screen at all. Can you hear me, Christina? I can hear you, Brad, okay. I can see you too. Okay. Um, so just a few things I saw from the QA I kind of wanted to, to speak on, um, you know, one of which had to do with certificated members, um, you know how we talked about reporting the appropriate pay rates earlier in my presentation so um, certificated members is a little bit different, you know, in the government code, it talks about certificated members should always earn full time service regardless of the hours that they work so for certificated members. You know, yes, their, their, you know, their pay rate should be based on what they truly earned, but we definitely prefer that for certificated members, you um, use the equal payment method. 
take that annual amount, spread it out over um, the amount of months that they work equally, the pay rate can match the earnings, and that way you can ensure that they indeed um, get their full year of service credit. So the conversion for pay rates doesn't have to necessarily work the same way for certificated. It just has to make you have to ensure that they get their full year. Another um, issue that kind of arose was about reporting daily rates. And um, you know, the answer provided was more about how you back into a monthly rate, but I think what the person was really asking was, you know, about daily rates. And yes, you, you can report daily rates. Daily rates are converted differently than monthly or hourly, um, but the same rule applies. You know, daily still should be based on what a person works on a 40 hour basis, full time, not, not the 7.5, not the six, but based on eight hours. Um, you know, I didn't have time today to show an example of a daily rate, but perhaps at the next SEAC meeting, I can show you guys what a daily rate conversion looks like as well. Or if you'd like to take the opportunity to send us an email and one of my team members can provide you an example of how a daily rate should be converted to account for the full time. And then the last thing I also saw um, was kind of about um, the lump sum reporting. And, you know, um, one of the issues normally deals with the way that the um, OSSP or any special comp item for that instance is bargained for, right? If you bargain for it as a lump sum and it's paid as a lump sum, that's where it creates a reporting issue. Because I understand you paid it as a lump sum and probably in your payroll system it's lump sum. And then your payroll uh, um, team members have to go in there and find a way to report it accurately to CalPERS, right? And the easy way is just to do the lump sum, but then it creates all those problems. So my suggestion is, is when, when these items are bargained for, bargain for it so that it's paid on a monthly basis or on a bi-weekly basis, you know, with however you pay it out. That way, when you pay it, it will just be paid bi-weekly or monthly and thus make it easier to report. Um, we've had a lot of, um, of our employers, not just school, but public agency as well, uh, talk about this issue. And when in nine times out of 10, when a agency bargains for a special comp in such a matter, we rarely see that lump sum issue because that's you'd basically be reporting the same way you were paid, which was as earned. Um, so hopefully I was able to um, kind of chime in a little bit more on some of those common questions we have. So um, let's open it up and see if we have any more. Uh, yes, we do have Ramona um, has our hand raised. Let's go ahead, Ramona. So I did type my question in. My question is when assigning the primary contacts at the district level for items like the payroll, financials, social security, things like that, will PERS be contacting the district first or directly and not contacting the COE? In most cases, I know for my team, we will contact the district first. Are you speaking about like the SB 278 penalties or just in general about all CalPERS items? Just in general about all CalPERS okay. items because they don't do the reporting piece. So sometimes they don't know what's being asked. They answer incorrectly. It, it, it gets escalated until it does reach my desk and then I step in and it was an easy solve, but. Yeah. You know, I, I think that what we, what we try to do is in our system, it will actually have an indication like who the payroll reporter is for the district. So if we looked up a school district and we saw that Stanislaw County office was a reporter, then we would we should contact you and not contact the district directly. I'm not sure if that is you know, always followed to a T, um, but that's something that I can talk to my, my folks about if that is an issue that you're seeing. Okay. But yeah, I mean, you know, roll of thumb normally, you know, you go into that employer on my CalPERS and then you see, oh, well, this is the contact. I'll, I'll, I'll call that payroll person. But I do know with the COEs, it, there's usually that extra level where we can check to see, you know, who reports yeah, payroll. Sometimes who reports, yeah, sometimes they complement it a little bit. Yeah. Or not, they, they complicate it a, a bit. Yeah. Gotcha. Gotcha. Any other questions? Christina, you know, you're muted. Yeah. Oh, I was just saying that I love it lately that Brad gets all the Q, <laughs> the questions when we've been doing presentations uh, lately. 
They don't call me friend of schools for nothing. <laughs> okay, we do have another raised hand. Um, this is from Erica. Okay. Go ahead, Erica. You're muted. There you go. Hi, good morning. I was wondering if you know when the CRB00356 error will be fixed. Um, sorry, go ahead. 356 or 357, the new one? No, 356. Which one is that? Um, that one tells us that the begin and end dates fall within multiple earned periods. Oh. Basically get it if um, we're not reporting for the entire month. So if someone starts working, say on the, on today, November 10th. Yeah. Report payroll starting with the begin date of November 10th. It gives us an error. Oh. So these stay on until the final upload and then we have to go to our payroll analyst to submit a request to have these overridden. And then they usually take at least a month. And then I get emails from somebody else at PERS asking me why my report is not posted. Gotcha. Um, you know, normally Cynthia Brown, um, she attends these, but she's on vacation today. So I don't have the answer. Um, Tony, I see you're logged in. Do you know if we have a SCR lined up for that one to be fixed or a SIR? Those are like our internal terminology we use for correcting the problems. What do you mean? We can check um, real quick and see if I can get an answer before the meeting ends. Okay. Um, if not, if we can get the employer's name, we can follow up with them to find out. Um, okay, sure. And provide additional information. Okay. Thanks, Tony. Sorry to put you on the spot. No problem. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Yeah, um, I have heard about that problem. I know that we were we wrote up um, an issue for the, for this to get it fixed in my calipers. It's just a matter of when that priority is taking place and what release that is. So Tony's going to look into that for us, and we'll get you the answer as soon as we can. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, I see a question in the chat, and um, I just need a little bit more clarification. It's question is if a certificated teacher only works a half assignment, they are supposed to receive a full year service credit question mark. I was just wondering if you can, um, if uh, that question could be clarified more, what they're talking about with the half assignment. You could type it in the chat if you don't want to say it out loud. In the meantime, we do have a couple more raised hands um, while we're waiting for that. Okay. Listen. Lucinda, go ahead. Hi, it's Lucinda from Santa Cruz County Office of Education. Um, I have a question on SB 278 in regards to the January 1st, 2020 bargaining unit agreement language and or memorandum of understanding language that districts are supposed to have um, for SB 278. Um, now, it's definitely not going to be able to, there's not enough time to put it in a bargaining unit agreement, um, but they could get memorandums of understandings done, but I'm unsure what type of language is supposed to be, um, what type of language you, PERS, is looking for um, to have. Okay. Um, well, you know, any type of special comp item that's reported to CalPERS, it has to be contained in a MOU or labor agreement. So if it's, if it's something you wanna report, it must be in there. Um, so, you know, the language can vary depending on the different types of special comp um, that you want out there. Um, there's actually within the PEARL, there's about nine, 10 different criteria that your special comp and your MOU or labor agreement have to meet in order to be compliant with CalPERS. Um, you know, has to be approved by um, your superintendent or your board, um, has to be publicly available, like has to be readily available for everybody to see, um, has to contain the conditions of payment. Um, you know, there's numerous different items that have to be added in there in order to make it compliant. Um, so, you know, if, if you have an MOU or labor agreement already and you want us to review and, and let you know if, if the language is good, um, we can do that. We also can work with you if it's not good to bring it into compliance as well. Or, or if you have a brand new item you're looking to bargain for, definitely um, let us know and, and we'll look at it. But you know, it, it really varies from item to item. You know, like a longevity pay, for instance, um, 
has to, you know, before you're even eligible for a longevity pay, um, a, a member has to work a minimum of five years with that employer. So, you know, you, let's say you have a longevity pay at the fifth year, you know, after they work five years, they get a 10%. And then after 10%, they get a 15. You know, you need to lay out all of those details. You know, what are the amounts? When is it reported? Um, what, when do they hit those different criteria? Is it available to an entire group or class? You know, the more that you can add in there in your labor agreement uh, or your MOU that, that clearly makes it transparent what you're reporting and how it's reporting, the better off it is for all of us because it'll make it easier to review and then it will be 100% um, transparent to the public as well. So it really can vary from, from item to item what kind of language that you need. Okay, so it's not language specifically directed to SB 278 for the charges that um, the district's going to incur or anything no. specific to this. It's actually each individual special comp item that the individual district may have, like longevity, long, um, bilingual, etc. And they have that in their bargaining unit, like you had said. Okay, so that helps clarify yeah. that for me. You really um, don't. Yep, go ahead. Sorry. The only thing that I would think that most of our districts may not have in their bargaining unit contract um, would be the one time off salary schedule payments. Um, you know, that's limited to 6% um, as long as they don't have a salary increase for the year. Uh -huh. um, and so usually they do have a separate memorandum of understanding yeah. mm -hmm. for the particular year that they may give that. So if they have that with the information on it. That should work too, just as long as it meets all of the criteria. The criteria. criteria. Okay. Right. You know, like for instance, a lot of the off salary schedule pays that we've seen um, this year didn't really meet the definition. They were more like a COVID stipend. We've heard them called things like hero pay or um, a COVID reward, but they were under the guise of an off salary schedule pay. So, you know, make sure that if you're doing an off salary schedule pay, it truly is in lieu of a pay increase and not just um, basically adding additional compensation to members for working during the pandemic. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. No problem. Okay. Um... Thanks everyone. Um, we're running out of time. So I know there were some questions that we weren't able to get to. So um, those will appear in our report. We'll get those answers for you and send them all out together in a full report for you. Um, also, there's gonna be a survey as soon as you log off. So please fill that out and submit it. Um, and then as a reminder, this will be available on our website um, by the end of the week or first of next week. So thank you all for joining us. Thanks to all our panelists and our employers. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.